Good morning, my Zion Memorial Missionary Baptist Church family and friends. I thank God that we are here another Sunday being here to be able to worship our God in spirit and in truth. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? For those who may be connecting via Facebook Live, can we give God a hand, clap of praise in whatever shape, form, or fashion, emoji that you want to give God right now, as well as those who may be calling in via the teleconference, we thank God for our ability to come and to connect together. We should understand that what God has done for us in our lives, we could not do for ourselves. For as the shirt I have on right now says, the message is, salvation is not a goal to be achieved. Salvation is a gift from God to be received. Amen. Amen. And beloved, that comes from the scripture found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, that reads, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. And in celebrating that gift, we do come together to worship our Lord in spirit and in truth. I would ask for those who are in the sanctuary with us now to please stand for the call to worship that is found within our church bulletin. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord. All together, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, and talk ye of his wondrous works. Let us pray, dear Lord, dear Father, I come before you on this second Sunday of August, dear Lord, excited about all that you can do, trusting, dear Lord, in what you will do, and giving you praise, honor, and glory already right now for it being done. We thank you, dear Lord, for bringing us back into your house of worship, dear Father, where we can worship you, O oh Lord, in spirit and in truth, dear God, as true worshiper, worshipers should. And I'm praying right now, Heavenly Father, that you will give us the confidence, the faith, and the trust to come before you, dear Lord. For we know you are the God who will never leave us. We know you are the God who will never fail us. And dear Lord, there is no other God to, to whom we can come, and there is no other name by which we can call upon you except the name of Jesus. And so in Jesus' name, dear God, we come asking you now to make this a sacred space in time. Be we on the phone, be we on Facebook Live, be we here in the sanctuary. Dear Lord, hold back every distraction that Satan's going to try to throw at us, dear God, to keep us from getting what you have in mind for us on this day. And so we ask you now, Heavenly Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that your anointing will run rich down upon us, dear God, from the crown of heads down to the sole of feet, dear Lord, that we will feel your power, feel your presence, Feel your love, and dear God, in this time of worship, we will be getting ourselves prepared to walk out and to share your presence, to share your power, and to share your love. Bless us in this time and coming together. And the redeemed sons and daughters of God said, Amen, 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 Amen. You may be seated. Beloved, on this Sunday um, that we have come together, it is the day after we had the homegoing celebration for Jade Samuels. And it was a blessing to have many within the house with us yesterday, socially distant, masked, safe, and giving God praise, honor, and glory for the life that he had given us in Jade Samuels. So we're asking for you to please do continue to keep the Samuels and the Perry family lifted up in prayer during this time of bereavement. And dear family, I also want to make mention that as we have dealt with one transitioning, we're also still in a period of transition ourselves. God has continued to birth new ministry and opportunity within Zion Memorial. We formed about a year or so ago a real property committee. We purchased a home, and now we're ready to dedicate that home, to make that home available to be rented. God is birthing something new within Zion Memorial. And so we're praying that you'll be prayerful about that. Right now we're planning our next Sunday after worship service, blessing the home, dedicating the home for those who have a desire to, for them to walk through the home safely, mass, socially distant, to see what God is doing in Zion. Our God is a real, relevant, and revealing God. These are apocalyptic times in Zion Memorial. There's an uncovering that's taking place as the power of God is still being revealed. And so we're excited about that happening for us in Zion. And the many other things that you will be hearing about God is doing a great work, but is that not what Jesus said that we were going to do? Amen. Greater works. And so we're just fulfilling the prophetic word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. And beloved, on this Sunday morning, 
As we said in our call to worship, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, and talk ye of his wondrous works. We have three who are going to come and bless us with their voices and to sing a song of God's wondrous works. Receive them in prayer and receive them encouraging them to do as God would have them to do in this time. Amen. As I look back over my life, I can see how your love has guided me. Even though I've done wrong, you never left me alone, but you forgave me. And you kept on blessing. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It's because of your mercies that we are not consumed. Because thy compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is our faithfulness. Great is our faithfulness. As I look back over my life, I can see how your love has guided me. Even though I've done wrong, you never left me alone, but you forgave me, and you kept on blessing. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It's because of your mercies that we are not consumed. Because thy compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is our faithfulness, great is our faithfulness. Lord, you've been so faithful. Even though sometimes I didn't do what you wanted me to do, you've been. Lord, you've been so faithful. I can never repay you, Lord, for what you've done for me. How you loose my shackles and you set me free. How you made way out no way. Turn my darkness into day. You've been my joy in a time of sorrow. Hope for my tomorrow. Peace in a time of storm. Strength when I'm weak and worn. I can never repay you, Lord, for what you've done for me. How you loose my shackles and you set me free. How you made way out no way, turn my darkness into day. You've been my joy in the time of sorrow, hope for my tomorrow. Peace in the time of storm, strength when I'm weak and worn. I can never repay you, Lord, for what you've done for me. How you loose my shackles and you set me free. How you made way out of no way, turn my darkness into day. You've been my joy in the time of sorrow, hope for my tomorrow. Peace in the time of storm, strength on a weekend. You've been, you've been, Lord, you've been so faithful. Even though sometimes I didn't do what you wanted me to do, you've been, Lord, you've been so faithful. Even though sometimes I didn't do what you wanted me to do. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. God continues to bless us with those who are willing to come and to share their gifts with, gifts with us. And now you're going to have to pray very heavily for your pastor because now i got to deal with these three divas um, in my house. Uh, I mean, no, no telling what's going to happen. We got the Clark sisters, maybe it'll be the Kane sisters, and, and, and mom. I don't know. Can we give God another hand clap of praise? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Beloved, on this Sunday, God has given us a word. And I would ask if you would please now stand for the reading of God's word. Um, in our previous days, we would have had all read together, but in this COVID-19 season, I will be doing the reading. And we'll be reading Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 30. A word that we have read before, a word that we have taught before, a word that we have preached before, but I'm praying for the newness and the revelation of God in it for us on this Sunday. Luke 18, chapter 18 through 30. The word of God reads, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? 
None is good, save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And the man, he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. So in the reading of God's word, let us pray, Dear Lord, dear Father, we come before you now thanking you in the name of Jesus. Thanking you, dear God, for salvation that is not earned, the salvation that is given. And we thank you, dear Father, that in giving us salvation, you don't hold us right where we are, dear God. That's but a beginning. And so we pray, dear Father, as we learn more about you, that as your children, as natural biological children can be similar to their birth parents, that we, your children, brought to you by the blood of Jesus, will be more like you. We ask you to open up our minds, our hearts, and our spirits during this time, dear God. Help us to retreat from the world and let you empower us to be more effective in the world for your cause, for your praise, your honor, and your glory. We thank you for this time. I ask you now, dear Father, as your humble servant, to use me, dear Lord. Let me not speak my words, but let me speak the words that you've given me boldly, confidently, and courageously, breaking through barriers that may hinder some, so they may receive the blessing you intend. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Beloved, I'm just excited about this day. Can we give God another hand clap of praise? And I tell you, God has continued to do new things right in front of us because um, one of our... Um, members, visitors who had not been with us in a while, has come to be with us today. Um, Donna's here with us, and we had not seen her in a while, and we thank God for you coming. So it's been a wonderful thing of us being able to open the church um, back up safely and in a very healthy fashion. But then when we think about being a part of the church, I want you to understand that God is a revealing God, and God wants us to be revealing people, us showing the world God through us, amen. But it requires something called faith to do that. Amen. Amen. Now, beloved, Scripture tells us that if we have faith that's just the size of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. We can move mountains with mustard seed-sized faith. But what if you had more faith than that? What could you accomplish if we had more than mustard seed-sized faith? What could we move? What could we do? What could we change? What could we be if we had more faith than that? Amen. If you had more faith in Jesus, could you finally turn the corner on making the right decisions in your life that could really, truly bring about the change that you're desiring? Well, what's the problem? In his book, Change or Die, Alan Dutchman wrote, when given the choice of changing, adapting, or dying, 90% of people would choose to die. In his book, Canoeing the Mountains, Todd Bosinger explained, in a study of those who were faced with exactly that choice, stop drinking or you will die. Stop smoking or you will die. Change your diet now or you will die. The, va the vast majority chose to just risk death and to keep on doing what they've been doing. If that is what everyday people are struggling with in how they make their decisions, how can we as Christians, being Christ following, become a part of the 10%? the top decile, the high achievers, the ones willing to never settle for being average or being normal, amen. To do so, we need someone or something who can get us 
from our normal to our abnormal. Get us from our typical to the atypical. Get us from our basic to our superior. Get us from our ordinary to our extraordinary. Amen. Amen. Such change requires something or someone who has done it to prove that it can be done. That someone, that something is Jesus. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And, beloved, as a Christian, we are called to be Christ-like. We are called to be like Jesus. So if you have not gotten your abnormal, if you've not gotten your atypical, if you've not gotten your superior, your extraordinary, then you might need more Jesus. Beloved, the title of today's message is, How Much Jesus Do You Want? How Much Jesus Do You Want? Beloved, we have turning points in our lives where the decisions we make have a huge impact on the lives that we live. As I like to say, your life will be the sum total of every single decision that you have made. Be it big, be it small, be it good, be it bad. Every decision that you make, starting from a child, it matters. You see, Jesus met a man, an accomplished man. A man with authority, responsibility, wealth, power, and influence who had clearly lived a life of seemingly good, wise decision-making. He got there because of the decisions that he had made. But, beloved, as every decision in your life will make up the substance of your life, a momentary lapse in judgment can destroy what it took you a lifetime to build. In your health, refusing to be socially distant and wearing a mask can cause you or others to get sick or possibly die. How you choose matters. In your wealth, putting your life savings into a get-rich-quick scheme can rob you of your retirement security and have your golden years tarnished by some foolishness in your earlier years. How you choose does matter. In your relationships, forgetting that beauty is only skin deep and pretty is as pretty does can have you linked up with someone who eventually makes you feel as if you have been given a prison sentence <laughs> because they do not love you as Christ loves the church and they do not respect you as one who is loved, treasured, and valued by God. How you choose, it matters. You see, beloved, this man came to Jesus, and it was a defining moment where he would have to make a life-changing, a life-altering decision and choice. In Luke 18 and 18, he asked, Good master, what should I do to inherit eternal life? The man asked a good question. Let, let me change that. The man asked a great question. Perhaps the greatest question that anyone can ask, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he had come to the right person to get that question answered. He went to Jesus. Now, beloved, in the hierarchy of God, there is none who is greater and there is none who is lesser. At least not according to the way the world gives out titles and, and, and lifts people up or tears people down depending on who they call you and what they call you. Well, you have some people who cannot and will not do unless you call them by a certain name associated with a certain title that they have. You see, Jesus made it clear, though, to his disciples that God was looking for something different for in Luke 22 and 27. He said, for who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I, Jesus, Jesus, am among you as one who serves. The motto of this church is servant leadership, leading by serving. We want to be like Jesus, amen. And because Jesus wanted to make sure that all he encountered understood that flat relational hierarchy. Some people like the pyramid scheme. Some people like to see somebody on top and people on the bottom. Jesus said, let's do this. Let's flatten it out. We're going to measure you on the basis of what you do and how you do it, not by what you are called. And so he wanted people to know that in the kingdom of God, God fitted you to a function that did not diminish or elevate because of the title by which you were called. And so Jesus had to get the man straight on something. So before Jesus answered the question, he had to make sure the man began to strip himself of the nomenclature, the naming where a man's value or a woman's value was really associated with what they were called more so than what they actually did for God. So in Luke 18 and 19, he told him, why callest thou me good? None is good except one, 
And the one who was good is God. Beloved, Jesus did not have a problem with the man addressing him as his function, as master or as teacher. That wasn't a problem. But he had a problem with this superlative he was putting on, this extra stuff, by calling him good. You see, Jesus clearly understood that he was fully human. Jesus was, like us, and fully divine, like God, which he is. And that in his humanity, even if he did not sin, his flesh craved sin. Just like all of our flesh craves sin sometimes. For even of David, the one who Jesus was descended from, he said of himself in Psalm 51 and 5, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And so Jesus understood what it was like for you to go through sin, even if he did not sin. For in Hebrews 4 and 15 it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. That means whatever you've gone through or whatever it is you're going through, Jesus went through too. He says, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he was without sin. He couldn't have been a perfect sacrifice if he fell in sin. Basically, as we like to sing, it's good to know Jesus. It's good to know the Lord. Amen. Amen. But beloved, as it's good to know Jesus, as it's good to know the Lord, what is far better what is far better is that we know that Jesus knows us. When I say knows us, he knows our struggles in our bodies. He knows our struggles in our minds. He knows our struggles in our hearts. And he knows our struggles in our spirits. And he has the audacity to love us anyway. Amen. Some people won't like or love you because what you're dealing with and what you're going through. But Jesus loves you anyway. He loves you anyway. And Jesus loved this man enough to say, listen, man, quit trying to pump my head up with this good master stuff. You want to talk, let's just talk. He, didn't, he wanted him to know that the earthly titles of exaltation only stood in the way of recognizing God for who God was and what God expected. And what did God expect of his people? Jesus asked a man about five commandments, just five. He said, okay, do not commit adultery. Do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, and honor thy father and thy mother. Beloved, all of these commandments had to deal with personal relationships. We weren't even getting to the high Christology of uh, honoring God. He was just saying, let's focus on how you treat folk, how you deal with people. Beloved, Jesus was setting this man up. It was a setup. It was a setup. Beloved, if you want to grow in your relationship with God, you need to know you're going to be humbled in some way. Why? Because James 4 and 5 tells us, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Giveth grace unto the humble. The unmerited favor of God, grace, comes to those who humble themselves before the Lord. Please hear what is being said by what is not being said. Prideful church attendance don't get you God's favor. Pridefully signing up for more ministries, more auxiliaries, more boards, and more committees than you are actually ever going to show up for and to serve them, that don't get you God's favor. Pridefully telling everybody how to get to heaven while you act like you got two bags packed with an express ticket to hell don't get you God's favor. Basically, what I'm trying to get you to understand is you might be the main obstacle standing right in the way of your next blessing. God's got it, but will you get it? You see, for the man, he showed that he had tried to do what was right within his own power. By responding to Jesus in Luke 18 and 21, all these have I kept from my youth up. I'm quite sure this time the man was, was, was kind of flexing a little bit, just pumping his chest out. Oh, you... You ain't, said, you ain't said a word to me, Jesus. You ain't said a word. You ain't said a thing. You see, beloved, I call this a setup because Jesus knew all this about the man. He knew what he had done. He knew what the man was going to do. And he knew why the man had done it. And because of the omniscience, the all-knowing power of God that Jesus had because he was also God, 
Jesus knew exactly what the man was lacking, where he was destitute, where he was dry and needed to be refreshed, where he was hungry and needed to be fed, where he needed more Jesus. Where he needed more Jesus. You see, in the 22nd verse, Jesus popped bubble by saying, hey, yet lackest thou one thing. Lackest thou one thing. Beloved, how many of us would be in a different place in our lives right now if it had not been for the one thing that we lacked? How many of us might have achieved much more in our lives if it had not been for that one thing that we lacked? How many of us might have been among the rich, the famous, the powerful, the noteworthy if it had not been for the one thing that we lacked? What our lives could have been if it had not been for the one thing that we lacked? I want to tell you a story. Some of you have heard this story, so just indulge me in the moment. When I was um, a student at Georgia Tech, an industrial engineering student, I went to see one of my advisors, an African professor, by the name of Dr. Augustine Essebois. He spent a lot of time encouraging and working with the minority engineering students at Georgia Tech. On one occasion, I went and sit with him because I was you know, feeling pretty good about myself because I was an AB student. At, at Georgia Tech, and, and, and being an A-B student in engineering at any school is, is pretty, pretty, pretty good, because engineering is a tough, tough area. But the thing was, that A-B student at Georgia Tech gave me superior standing among the minority students, so I was doing much better than other black folk at Georgia Tech. Beloved, sometimes what we lack is disabusing ourselves of the best among the least mentality. You see, I might have stood on the top of the black students, but the black students were in the minority, at Georgia Tech. I, I want to call it, some of y'all might have heard this, it's called the crab mentality. As long as I'm on top of the other crabs, even though we all crabs, I think I've accomplished something because I'm on top of all the other crabs. But you see, Dr. Esselbar, he was a man who liked to eat crab for a meal, but he had great disdain for crabs as people. Didn't care about the crab mentality among people. So he told me, well, Randy, you're in good standing here at Georgia Tech. And I was like, hey. You're making good grades, and you will be able to get a good job when you finish. I'm like, hey, hey, hey. He said, you're one of the top black students here at Georgia Tech. I said, hey, 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 hey. At this point, I was feeling pretty satisfied with what I had accomplished. I was one of the top students among the black students, but not necessarily all students. I had fallen victim to the crab mentality. As Jesus set the man up, Dr. Esselbaugh set me up. For he continued, but, almost like Rafiki in the Lion King. I'm like, but what? He said, but you are not doing what the white boys are doing. He said, while well, you are making A's and B's, the white boys are making A's. Now, there was some truth in that. All the white boys weren't making all A's. But there was a standard out there. So I humbly swallowed my previously swelling pride. That pride that God resists as God got me ready to receive some grace. But then Dr. Esselbois added, you should be making A's like the white boys. I had gone through West Forsyth here in Clemens, North Carolina. Nobody ever told me that. I had gone through four years at Morehouse College and nobody ever told me that. I got to Georgia Tech with this African professor who looked at me and he told me that. Beloved, Dr. Esselbois' words were my grace for as John 8 and 32 tells us, and ye shall know the truth and the truth <laughs> shall make you free. <laughs> Dr. Esselbois freed me in that moment before he, because he acknowledged uh, the, 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 what I had accomplished and, 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 and that was fine and then he challenged me to seek and to expect more of myself than what I thought I even had to give. Beloved, from that point forward at Georgia Tech I was a straight A student. Something that was in me but I didn't even know it was inside of me because nobody had challenged me to go for it, to go do it. So in my senior year I went from just looking for a good job to also applying to two of the top business schools in the world. And I was fortunate enough to get admission to the top business school in the world, Harvard Business School. I entered in 1992, I graduated in 1994. 
And by the way, Dr. S. Wabois, he wrote my two letters of recommendations to both schools. Amen. Beloved, Jesus is looking to write some letters of recommendations for some of his children who are willing to step up and to do what they don't think they can do, but because of Jesus, they will dare to try to do. So that we will not set our standards so low that we will accept meager rewards because of our meager efforts. He's inspiring us to do more and to be more. And beloved, to understand, God has a level of achievement in mind for each and every one of us. It is not absolute. It's relative to however God has blessed you. But for you to get to whatever it is you're going to be, you need to decide, how much Jesus do I want? How much Jesus do I want? You see, Jesus continued his conversation with the man by challenging him to step up his game like Dr. Escobar challenged me. He was trying to get this man to go for all eight. So he said, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. The man was challenged by Jesus as we are all challenged in our lives in some way. Amen. He was asking the man to look at excellence in a different way as we all should be striving for excellence in some way in our lives. And do understand the challenge put before the man was not universal. It fit the man right where he was. Jesus was not asking this man to do something that he couldn't do. He was asking the man to do something he hadn't done. And it all depended on how much Jesus the man actually wanted. Beloved, how much excellence do you want in your life? And I'm saying the life you live in right now, it is too easy for a baby to be born in a family and everybody to put their hopes and dreams and desires on that child. But I'm like, why are you hoping, dreaming, and desire? What about you? What you going to do with your life? Who said you get a pass and they got to bear the burden of what you didn't achieve? And therefore, you want to vicariously live through them. Why can't you keep living too? You still got breath in your body. Why can't you keep living too? And seek after the goodness and the greatness of God. How bad do you want to get ahead in life? Not just for another day, but for a better and a brighter day. How bad do you want to st stop living the shoulda, coulda, woulda life? And live a life filled with I will, I can, and I do. You see, at some point, we all need to take an inventory of our lives. And our health, our wealth, and our relationships. And as where are we on the continuum of bad, good, and great? You see, while good is better than bad, good is the enemy of the great. And as for Christians, for us to be really great, we're going to have to determine how much Jesus do we really want. You see, this man in this critical moment of his life, likely the most important moment of his life, when Jesus challenged him to stop settling for A's and B's in life and to strive for A's, as Luke 18 and 23 tells us, was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Beloved, let us be clear. The man's problem was not his money. That was not his problem. The problem was his love for his money was greater than his love for God. So he had a problem when the master, who he called good, like God, told him how to be better on his way to being his best by following God. Jesus. It turns out that he wanted the keys for entering to the kingdom of God until he found out how much it would cost. So he was sad. Beloved, I give this man great credit, a lot of credit, because at least he was willing to lay it on the line and ask the question. So many, those who are part of the plentiful harvest, never reach out to the few laborers out there because their love for the world surpasses their love for God. And I'm not just talking about the unchurched. It's church folk out there who still act like they really haven't come to God. And they don't want to truly hear the truth of God because they don't want to change what they're doing and how they're doing it. As I said, pride for church attendance ain't going to get you no grace from God. You see, it's hard to give up what you love in this world to receive the love of God, but our God told us that he's a jealous God, and you won't have no other gods before him. So when you put another God before him, you got some problems. You got some problems. 
You see, Jesus put it this way with this man's challenge in Luke 18 and 25. For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, before again, we start demonizing the rich folk, which for some of us can simply mean somebody got a nicer house, a bigger car, and more money in their bank account than what we got. We all got the folks out there who are like that. We need to understand that Jesus was explaining that whatever or whoever stands in the way of you furthering your relationship with God, be it money, be it things, be it people, these are a problem with you entering the kingdom of God because you need the kingdom of God, but you can only have it when you decide how much Jesus do you really, really want. Now the disciples were hearing all this, and they were confused. You see, according to the Jews, if you had good or great health, if you had good or great wealth, or if you had good or great relationships, you were supposed to be close or at least closest to God, according to the Jews, versus those who had bad health, like those who were on their sick bed of affliction, those who had uh, bad wealth, those who show up in uh, soup kitchens, food pantries, those dealing with bad or possibly even no credit, or bad relationship, those on their next marriage, um, 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 those who have family that consist of more outlaws in terms of your in-laws or even those who in your own family treat you like an outlaw even though you're not an in-law you're like well I'm in and they treat you like you out you see beloved if we're real honest with ourselves we treat many people exactly like that today we do that to people. And then we wonder why the harder we run after some people, the faster they run away from us. You see, many of us are very historically Jewish in our present day Christianity. And in their historical Jewishness, Jesus' disciples asked in Luke 18 and 20, says, well, Jesus, who can be saved? This rich man can't be saved. This man who's somebody in the synagogue can't be saved. Who can be saved? Like the rich man that asked, they asked a really good question. Who can be saved? Jesus responded that with words that we all need to hear and understand. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Are possible with God. Said another way, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing's impossible with God. It's all right if you give God a hand clap of praise on that. Especially if you believe it. There ain't nothing wrong with you giving God a hand clap of praise on that. A way of making this maybe a bit more real for you. How many of you have heard of or even been to or seen the Statue of Liberty? Beloved, in 1886, the Statue of Liberty was given to the United States of America by the French. Many thought, and we think today, that it was to commemorate immigrants coming to the country. That's how we perceive that. It was actually given by the French to America to commemorate the ending of slavery. A lot of people don't know that. But that's why when you look at the Statue of Liberty at the bottom at the feet, you see a broken shackle and broken chains. You see, for 400 years, the impossibility of freedom for an enslaved people was denied, but then God. Then God. Beloved, in 1903, 17 years later, the words of many associated with the Statue of Liberty were then added. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. These were added to be inclusive of many oppressed people who were coming to this land to be free. Beloved, while the words are symbolic, the substance behind them at times can seem so fleeting in this country. You see, while no longer legally enslaved people, we are still pursuing liberty. We're still pursuing freedom. Freedom that only comes when one has, knows, appropriates, and lives out the truth that's found in God. In many ways, the Statue of Liberty stands as a reminder that freedom can only come from God, not from man. For how can a man set you free when he's not free indeed himself? And look, while we pursue this freedom in God, sometimes we need to take a step back and ask ourselves, is it worth the cost? Is it worth it? You see, the disciples at this time, they had left everything to follow Jesus. They weren't like the rich man. 
But I'm going to say it like this. Whether you got a little or got a lot, what's yours is yours. And if you walk away from it to follow somebody else, you have invested all you have into it. Amen. But Jesus wanted to let them know that not only was it only possible to be saved by God, but it was impossible to lose with God. It was impossible to lose with Jesus. You see, in their limited view of what was happening, the disciples were left with questions and Jesus had to recognize what they had left behind and to encourage them to keep on pressing ahead. So he said in Luke 18, 29 through 30, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come life everlasting. Beloved, Jesus wanted to get it across to his disciples back then as well as right now that our mission is to seek the kingdom of God. And in doing so, we can't lose. Does the scripture not say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. The first law of thermodynamics. Folks getting ready to go back to school. So, so I'm going to throw a little edumacation on. The first law of thermodynamics, also known as the law of conservation of energy, states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Energy can only be transferred or changed from one form to another. Beloved, the energy in our bodies, our minds, our hearts, and our spirits was given to us by God. We did not create it. We cannot destroy it. We can only use it for the glory of God or not. And God gave us everything that we would need when he created this world and gave us dominion over this earth. Sometimes we need to view everything from the perspective of God and realize our perceived ownership of wanting to hold on to our stuff is really just a season of stewardship over what rightfully belongs to God. How can I prove it to you? When you transition to the other side of glory and they have your home going service, ain't really much room in that casket but just for you. Everything else is left behind for other folks to receive the portion of the will or unfortunately in some families folks just to fight over your stuff when you're gone. You see, when we look at it from a godly perspective, Psalm 24 and 1 reminds us the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. That means everything and everybody belongs to who? God. And Psalm 50 and 10 echoes, for every beast of the forest is mine, God says, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. That means everything belongs to God. And if God, the creator and rightful owner of all things, will never leave you or forsake you, and you living your life, you pursuing your greatness, the holiness and the righteousness of God, then you should know that your steps are ordered by the Lord and all that you count as lost in pursuing God in Job-like fashion where Job lost it all and God gave him a double portion on the other end is another set up by God as for an unimaginable gain on this side of glory and on the other side of glory. You can't lose betting on God. You see, beloved, when you decide that Jesus is who you want and you don't need anybody else, then God is going to make a deposit in your spiritual uh, bank account, in your emotional bank account, and in your mental bank account, and maybe even your physical bank account that may not even be financial, but God's going to put a credit in there that you can draw upon to help you through whatever it is that you're going through. For God can bless your health, wealth, and relationship in ways that you know that God has just maybe even just cracked open a little bit the windows of heaven. And with that crack that God gives you, he gives you more than you will ever have room to receive. What I mean is that when God blesses you, you may not be able to explain it to the lovers of your soul. You may, so, may also not be able to explain to the haters of your existence. You see, beloved... You might not be able to explain the favor that God gives to you, to those who just do not understand 
Why you? Why did God favor you? They really don't want to deal with the bigger question. They'd rather deal with you. The question is, why isn't God favoring me? And I'm going to tell you this. You don't need to guilt trip yourself because somebody else is tripping. And understand that your favor is not your fault. Your favor is God's choice. So God blessed you because God wanted to bless you. And that's all the explanation that you need to give anybody. Amen. Amen. But know that when you decide you want more Jesus, you should expect more favor from God. For when you invest your life, not the part but the whole, the whole, your whole life in God, you are investing in not your better self, but you're investing in your best self with a payoff coming on this side of glory and on the other side of glory. And on the other side of glory. So, beloved, again, I ask the question, how much Jesus do you want? How much Jesus do you want? You know, you, 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 you may go to a deli and get you a sandwich. Maybe you get you a turkey sandwich on rye with lettuce, tomato, and some Swiss cheese. You say, I want some mustard. And they say, well, how much do you want? You might say, a little dab. A little dab will do me. How much Jesus do you want? Do you just want a little dab? Or do you want it all? Do you just want Jesus to forgive your sins? Or do you want to live your life in a way in which God will bless you at all times? And so, beloved, the question that comes up again is, then, what is the one thing that is holding you back? What is it that's keeping you from giving your all to Jesus? And is it worth it? Is it really worth it? If you gave it over to God, would you trust God enough to replace the void created by you say, I gave this away, now there's a hole. Would you trust God to fill it with what God wants you to have in your life? Trust me, it will be something bigger and better than what you've imagined. Jesus said he would if you would. It comes down to, again, just that one question. How much Jesus do you want? If you want it all. Does anybody want it all? Does anybody want it all? Does anybody want all of Jesus? Because, again, now there, 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 there may be those turkey sandwich folk who just want a little dab. But if you want it all, perhaps you will let your mind, heart, and spirit resonate around these words that I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And when I say no turning back, what I mean is the world behind me and the cross is before me. The world is behind me and the cross is before me. The world's behind me and the cross is before me. There is no turning back. No turning back. Beloved, take Jesus in hold, not in part. And don't you turn back. Don't you turn back. Decide to follow Jesus and be prepared for your life to change. Not for the better, but for the best. But it all depends on when you decide how much Jesus do you want. Amen. 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 Beloved, I thank God for this moment that we have in life right now. Um, as I've said to you many times, this is an apocalyptic time. COVID-19, for the, for, for, the, for the darkness and the death and the sickness that come along with this is an apocalyptic time. And I'm not talking about apocalyptic in terms of some folks want to run the scripture, run the books like Revelation. They want to go in and say, this is it. This is the end times. I'm like, what a waste of time. Jesus said only the Father knows when he's coming back. But we got these folks who want to spend all their time trying to figure out something they can't figure out. If Jesus don't know, how you know? But instead... If you will dare to use your time to pour into God and to give God your best at all times, watch how God will work. 
Watch what God will do. You will find you're busting at the seams with opportunity to give God praise, honor, and glory. I had one of our trustees come hit me up this morning already saying, Pastor, we need some more people because we got too much work to do. I'm like, that's a high-quality problem to have. And I'm going to trust God to provide. Amen. I'm going to trust God to provide. Because God does not give us problems to frustrate us. God gives us problems to set us up. Amen. To see God even better. Amen. Beloved, I want to speak a word of prayer over you now. Dear Lord, dear Father, we come before you now in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Trusting and believing in this moment, dear Father, that you have given us. That we have a decision before us to make God. And if we choose rightly, if we choose righteously, dear Father, that you will take us, dear Father, to places and help us to do things that we've never imagined, dear Lord. You're already doing it, dear God. I know within this church family and other church families around the globe, you're birthing things and you're doing things. Some people, though, have already decided they don't want any more Jesus than what they got. And therefore, they're not going to get any more revelation. They're not going to get any more apocalyptic moments. They're not going to get any more creation. They're not going to get any more beginnings than what they're willing to have. But not us, Lord. We want you. And we want all of you. And we want you to take all of us, dear Father. We truly want to be the clay and recognize you as being the potter. So, dear Lord, we surrender ourselves unto you now for you to fashion us and to remake us into who and what you would have us to be. And so I pray over those who have come and gathered with us in the house. I pray for those who are connecting with us on Facebook Live and on the phone, that you will understand that you just need to keep giving it over to God and trusting in God in the name of Jesus as guided by the Holy Spirit. And he will not only never leave you or forsake you, he will never make a mistake with you or fail you. He will bless your life. And you will find that it's not just for you, that you're going to be blessed to also be a blessing to others. Thank you, God. And in this moment, dear Father, I say that the doors of the church are open, and there may be one who does not have that relationship with you right now. They're still teetering, dear God, in terms of knowing about you, dear Jesus, but not really knowing you. About knowing about you, dear God, but not really knowing you. About knowing about you, Holy Spirit, but not really knowing you. Remember, your life right now and your life to be is based off of every decision that you have ever made, are making, and will make. Today, make the decision to give it all to God and Jesus Christ as guided by the Holy Spirit. If you believe God is calling you and you're ready to answer that call, I pray that you will reach out. Connect with us via the touch points with the church, either by mail, calling the church, or even calling me directly. I've given my cell phone number out many a time. You can go to the church website and find all that information. And so I'm not going to keep giving it by speaking it. I challenge you to take the step and just go get it. And we're here for you. We're here for you. We're here for you. And dear God, I pray over our brothers and sisters in Christ who are trying, really trying to do the best they can in this moment of life. And sometimes it does get hard. And sometimes like the disciples, we want to ask Jesus, are we doing what it takes? Because sometimes it gets hard. And dear Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray you will answer us. I'm still here. And I'm still working it out. And I'm still loving you. And I always will. Until you're here with me. And I am with you. And so, dear Lord, for all, I pray that the word of today has been a blessing, that it can be received in a way that you will get praise, get honor, and get glory. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. amen. Beloved, can we give God a hand clap of praise? If that did something for you today, if perhaps that answered some questions for you today, if perhaps that helped you to take a further step closer to God today, can we again give God a hand clap of praise? On Facebook Live, if that bless you today, can we just show God some praise that this baby just put some clap hands emojis that we are truly trusting that God is doing a wonderful thing in this season. That God is blessing us right now. And that we're going to strive to be a blessing unto God. We're going to be salt. We're going to be light in this world. 
And God's going to bless the world through us because we are the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, dear God, for this opportunity. No matter what comes against us, God is with us and God is for us. Thank you, Lord. Beloved, another Sunday God has given us. It's still early in the day. I pray as you go out and you reflect on the time that we've had together, that God will keep blessing you, keep blessing you. And that perhaps the Spirit will keep speaking to you, keep bringing God's words back to you, and keep growing you as long as you make yourself available, as you give more of yourself to Jesus, because Jesus is ready to give his all to you. And so as we prepare to depart, I pray you will understand that God's Spirit will not depart from you, that he will be with you forever. Let us prepare ourselves with the attitude of being dismissed from each other's presence, but never from the presence of God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, dear Father, we thank you for this day, for our time of coming together. Dear God, we know you're always available to us, but dear Lord, how rich and blessed it is for when the saints come together, when we assemble, dear Father. For those who know you who are growing in you, who may not be quite where we want to be, dear God, but we know you've not let us go for he who you hold in your hand, she who you hold in your hand, dear Father. No one can pluck out, so let us not get up and try to run out. Let's continue to run into you in faith, trust, and belief, knowing that you're going to cover us and keep us, provide for us, and protect us from this day forward. Bless us as we go out. Let us remember that we should seek to be used by you wherever we go. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Oh, we want all of you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, the Redeemer, the Lord said, Amen, amen, amen.